Aloha, aloha, and welcome back to Talk Story with John Waihe and our continuing series on heroes, rascals, and duds, the people who made contemporary Hawaii. And today our guest is a very special person. It's a, his name is Gary Kubota. Gary is a um, longtime journalist in Hawaii, in fact, award-winning journalist. And he's a playwright. Uh, and uh, and for today's uh, discussion, he's also author. He's also the author of a book called Hawaii Stories of Change, and it is the Kukua Hawaii Oral History Project. And, and by the way, folks, if you haven't read this book, I would really recommend that you get a copy or pick up a copy from someplace. And because it, um, it, it covers an, uh, an er era that many people don't really know about in Hawaii. And it, uh, about, let's say, 50, more, a little over 50 years ago in the state of Hawaii uh, were the origins of a protest movement. Now, What's so interesting about all of this to me is that you need to know that this all happened after a lot of the legends that we talked about uh, had their uh, return back to Hawaii and, and had their chance to develop uh, Hawaii primarily after statehood. What I'm talking about is the, uh, the Nisei, Democratic Revolution, all of that came to Hawaii. And, we have always, in our history, in our contemporary history, counted that as a um, as a major, uh, major, major shift in uh, in Hawaiian uh, governance and, and politics, and, and and correctly so, rightfully so. And yet, what's interesting to me is that in 1969, 1970, there was this unrest going on about the um, what was happening in Hawaii. In other words, the children of the reformers were saying, we need to have uh, a reform. We need to have a revolt. And, began, and something began. And the person who knows the most about what happened in the late 60s and early 1970s is with me today. And uh, so welcome, Gary. Thank you. I, 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 Thank you for having me. Not only did you write the book, you actually participated, right? I mean, you, 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 were, uh, you were there, <laughs> you know, and this is not something that you just had to research. Right. I was a member of a Kukua Hawaii. I, I became a member after I got arrested in Kalama Valley. I was there just to support the group. Uh, opposing an eviction of Hawaiians and farmers. I thought that it was um, really unspeakable, that, that unacceptable for, for uh, developments of that sort to be able to push out uh, poor working people. Um, and they included people who had fought in the war. Hawaiians who had fought in war were fighting in Vietnam, Japanese too, Filipinos losing their lives. Um, so there was a huge contradiction at that time. Um, you know, between, so here, yeah, be, between what, what 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 was happening in Hawaii and, and what was happening in Columbia Valley, right? Right. I mean, go ahead. I, I was just going to say though that you recently, I think it was May 11th, you recently celebrated uh, or commemorated the uh, the evic the arrest, your arrest, I guess, uh, right. uh, among others. Uh, in Kalama Valley. May 11th was the 50th anniversary. Yeah, 1971, yeah. And, uh, so tell us a little bit about the background as you were doing. And also, we want to hear about the people who were involved, uh, yourself, obviously. But uh, who, who else was involved with K Kukua Hawaii? Well, we had a pretty wide mix of ethnicities. I mean, one person was a graduate of, or, or was close to being a graduate of Annapolis, Linton Park, 
And he and his brother decided to oppose the Vietnam War. Like that, they didn't like what was happening to the to Asian, the, the way Asians are being treated, not only in Vietnam, but um, in the nation as a whole. Uh, you know, it, it, it really ran deep and uh, part of the problem was back then that uh, although the 442nd 100 Battalion had come back as heroes, it, they weren't in the history books. You know, it was a basically a same old, same old, uh, civilization started in the Tigris Euphrates and moved through Europe like that. And there was nothing uh, in the books about uh, Hawaiian history or uh, the fight for uh, labor rights and things like that. Um, so th there was an inequity and imbalance in terms of like whose stories got told. Yeah. And, and so who, who are these? Uh, tell me about more about these brothers. You know, who are they and, and the like? And how, how did how do they fit into all of this? I, I, we know that they were obviously activists, uh, anti-Vietnam War, and it seemed that, at, that in the early, late 60s, early 70s, that was the protest against Vietnam was uh, pretty, on, uh, pretty strongly felt on uh, the U University of Hawaii camp. Right. Does, does that predate, does that, uh, do, do those pro protests predate Kalama Valley or? Yeah, they Kalama predate Valley? Kalama Valley and then they were happening during Kalama Valley itself like that in 71. Uh, you had the terror offensive, I think, I believe in 69, where, you know, it was pretty much obvious that we were, the United States was losing the war. They didn't have the support of the, 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 the people at that time in Vietnam. And, and, uh, you know, there's corruption out evidently in that. The, the thing about it, I guess, is that, you know, and I learned about it later, Soli Niheo, who was a leader of our organization, um, you know, he was in the military at one point. And uh, I, I heard later on and learned later on that he had a real bad, bad story. Uh, he was in the South and he was with all these other people on a Jeep returning from uh, to the barracks. And all of a sudden the MP singled him out, pulled him out of the car. I mean the the jeep, and uh, threw him in jail. Wow! And he was there for uh, a number of days, and he got beaten up. You know and why? What was it? He what was the was... only he was the only non-white guy in the group. Wow! So that and so Soli comes home to Hawaii, and he Correct. he he organizes. I guess as you said, he was a leader in the yeah. Kokua, Hawaii. Uh, who else? Who else? Um, uh, who did Soli? Uh, Ed Ed Ching Ed Ching came back like that, and he he um, basically he didn't get beaten up, but he saw that he saw how how the, <laughs> the 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 military operated like that, and it was it was not a you know it was not a, 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 a an equal thing. I mean, obviously. Um, Part of the problem, I think, was that a lot of people weren't aware of Asian contributions to the United States to things like that during my father's time. I mean, my father was a decorated war hero who had actually rescued, helped to rescue the Texas regiment that was surrounded by Germans like that. And, you know, two other Texas regiments had tried to rescue them. And my father's regiment was the one called in to, to actually break through the lines. And they did. And it cost them dearly, you know, and, uh, and and that's a fantastic story uh, yeah. for the four forty second. But so on these... a personal on a Go personal ahead. level, and this is something I haven't talked. To, I talk about it in the book because I think it's necessary. And you know, I didn't want to go to war. Obviously, I didn't. I didn't. You know, once I saw what was happening, I didn't believe in it. But the other part was that I remember, you know, uh, as a surfer rescuing three Marines off. Fort de Russi during the summer, it was like a freakish, it was, I think about 69, during a freakish, it was storm surf and stuff like that. So I get them on the beach, John, you know, and they, they said, wow, thank you, thank you, you know. I mean, they were calling for help. They were about a good three quarter miles out, you know, and I was wow. about, you know, a mile and a half out because that, you know, you got at least two breaks, huh? and I wanted to catch <laughs> the, the second break and then catch the, the next break, right? You know, that's right, a long right. ride that way. 
So I'm hearing them, but nobody else can hear them because there's only me and the other Hawaiian guy and the Hawaiian guy had gone in. Boom, you know, so I kick out over there and I take, get them, you know, I show them how to give them my surfboard and they, they, they go to the channel where it's, you know, less, less waves and things and we get in and then they asked me if I was Hawaiian. I said, no, no, you know, I'm, I'm actually Japanese like that. But, you know, I've been living here. On my... And one of the guys says, and, you know, they're, they're only in their 20s like that, maybe even some 19, 18. And he said, you mean we got rescued by a gook? You know? And then the, one of the guys that suddenly realized what they were saying and they apologized, you know? And it didn't strike me at the time as anything big. You know, so I just wanted to get back and go surfing. You know what I mean? I thought, well, you know, blankly blank, you know, don't go in the water. <laughs> Promise me you're not going back in the water. And then I went that loud again. But I thought about it later on. I thought, you know, here you are like that. That supposedly like the Marines and everything. And they're calling the Asians. How, how are you going to win a war when you call in the people like that gooks? You know. Yeah, I, you know, and, and so this is the background for yourself and, yeah. and Soli and, and others that, that came together at Kalama Valley. Now, as I understand Kalama Valley, it was actually the Bishop Estate who owned the yes. property that were uh, looking at developing it. And uh, so the policy in Hawaii at that time was uh, pretty pro-development, I, I would think. Uh, otherwise, this wouldn't be proceeding. And as a result, uh, I, I'm, uh, Kukua Hawaii got founded, uh, started. Yeah, but I think before before you went to there, what what what, what happened? I mean, who did you talk to? How do you get organized? Uh, how does all of this happen? Well, um, I came in. I came in a little later, but basically, the the person who who had a blueprint was Larry Kamakaviva Ole. And Larry came back from Berkeley and he had been listening to lectures by Bobby Seale, one of the Black Panthers. And Bobby actually went to his church and lectured on a Sunday like that. It was like a, a regular session for like about, must've been about three months or something like that. Larry, Larry got to know Bobby Seale. Bobby Seale later became mayor of Oakland, right? So, right. I mean, what a transformation huh, for him to be elected mayor after being a Black Panther. Um, and so Larry, you know, took to heart certain kind of practices and things like that. And, and uh, we, we um, used those practices in, in what we did, and, you know, in terms of how you organize a march. How do you organize uh, a demonstration with thousands of people there? You know, how do you respond to people saying, well, why can't you all get, get along together? You know, why do you want to like cause, point out separate points of separation in terms of race like that? And wow. I think that, um, you know, they're, they're very articulate. Um, Larry and Kalani Ohello, Kalani especially. Kalani, Kalani was Ohello, was, where was he from? Ohello Housing. And I mean, he, he, he knew how to talk to the poor people. Um, the lumpins, the you know, the semi semi uh, criminals or whatever, the, the <laughs> elements that you know some people would would not really want to talk to. We, they went into the prisons, and they they completely mesmerized, as I understand the, the the prisoners like that. You know, one of them said, "Well, we, you know, we enjoyed it so much. Uh, we we don't want you guys to go." <laughs> <laughs> and what they didn't want to stay. Okay, we're at our halfway mark right now, so we're going to right. take a short one-minute break, and then we'll be right back to hear about more of the people who laid the foundation for the modern pro contemporary protest movement in Hawaii.
Yeah, we want to come back to where we left off, you know, with Larry and Kalani. And I, I just wanted to mention, you know, the uh, Larry Kamaka Vibiole actually becomes the uh, father of ethnic studies at the University of Hawaii. I, I remember part of the protest, in addition to Kalama Valley, was something, uh, if I recall, uh, called Our History, Our Way, which is you already begin to start to talk right. about. One of the things we did is effectively stop evictions uh, in several communities, helped to stop it. Of course, it was more than just us. Uh, Kota Camp in Waipahu, Waiholi Waikane, Census Tract 57 in Kalihi, Haula, Heiakea, um, and even um, in um, Kauai, like that, there was, there was something going on, Nukuli at the time. Nokali, Nokali. Well, let, let's talk about some of that. Who, who are some of the people involved in um, uh, Waiholi Waikani, for example? Uh, Soli Nihkeo is one, and Soli was, uh, for, for when he got arrested, he was like the, actually the, 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 almost like the head of the park, the recreation part of Kali Palama. I mean, he had, he had, you he know, worked he, had, he, had in, uh, he worked in, he, he worked, I, I was working at uh, Model Cities at that time. And, right. And Soli was in charge of the recreation part for the city in the Model Cities program. And right. he was still, but he was, you know, he was as active as you could be beyond the job. And he was involved in Waiholi Waikani. What about um, people like the... Joy on Joy on who uh, had been uh, at one point a congressional aide to Patsy Mink. She was teaching at Wainai High School and she got arrested in Kalama Valley. I mean, these are people who had careers and they put it on the line in order to make a statement. Um, and, you know, I, I greatly admired them for that. I mean, what they, about, they, what about uh, somebody like Pete Thompson? Pete Thompson was, was an instructor in ethnic studies and he was a, he became the go-to guy when it came to, if you needed research, if you needed a point of view that was like different than, was more native in terms of the tourist industry, in terms of H3, Pete, Pete became the, the, the go-to guy. As far as being a journalist, I would call up Pete and I'd say, Pete, I want to interview you. Or else, Pete, <laughs> I was working for the TV stations as a production kind of person for a while as a student. Pete, uh, Don Robs wants to interview you. <laughs> <laughs> well, I tell you, I'll give you my own uh, personal, um, my personal, you know, story about Pete Thompson, and that was during the 1978 Constitutional Convention, and Pete Thompson actually came and talked to a group of delegates who who were all sort of undecided whether they would like to see. Uh, initiative and referendum uh, passed by the convention. And he gave, he gave one of the most articulate, he was, a, I, I, he, he was one of the most articulate persons I, I've ever heard. And he gave this great speech about how poor people vote with their body. And we don't have the money to do a referendum, but we have the bodies to close down the Capitol. And I was sitting there and I was, fascinated by uh, this stuff yeah yeah well actually, that's actually solely... what we did you know uh, yeah. when it came to um pete locking arms in chinatown to oppose the, the eviction of uh you know tenants there when we were uh at ethnic uh at the at the university administration building in manoa and had 500 people including community members of the community all these leaders who were facing who communities were facing eviction came out. They brought their stew, bowls of pots of stew and things like that to support it. And we ate really big on around evening time. And you always see uh, the the crowd, the crowd of students kind of swell around it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, what about what about some of the grassroots people like like Kalani, for example, but the Kalahiki brothers? Oh yeah, no. Randy, Randy, Kale, Randy Kalahiki, um, Sammy Lono, uh, they were just, and Buddy Ako, just fantastic. And all of them, like, uh, you know, they, they would come and support ethnic studies. And Randy and Sammy appeared 
when we were going to get before we were going to get arrested and i was wondering you know what the, later on i figured it out they didn't want violence to occur you oh. know and you know a lot of the police knew who randy was and a lot of police knew who lona was so you know the last thing they wanted to do was get lono and randy angry at him and lono actually wanted to get arrested but nobody would touch him he was going around doing this, arrest me, arrest me, and the police would back away. <laughs> well, you know, that, that, that is such an amazing aspect of, of, of Sam Lono, because the, 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 the legend that grew up around him basically was he was this cultural practitioner. And then he provided, uh, you know, the chants and, and sort of the, the uh, I guess, the cultural ambiance of, of, of parts of the movie. Oh, he, but yeah, he was much he was he, but he was much more than that. He was right? much more. The place where he lived was in a haiku in the back. And what happened is that the community association in the development had extinguished his trail. So he sued them and he won. <laughs> <laughs> because you cannot extinguish a Hawaii traditional Hawaiian trail. So they had to provide him access through the community, like we would go up to the guard gate and say, we're going to see Lono. And they say, oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> and we well, park, well, you know, park in their neighborhood like that. And, you and, know, there and was, it was a court case called Lono, Sammy Lono versus Haiku Community Association. And it, it uh, decided in favor of Sammy Lono. Well, what about the minstrel of, of the movement? What about Lico Martin, you know, and some of those types of he was around at that time, wasn't he? He was. He got arrested with us, and uh, you know, Liko is the kind. He's he's uh he follows his own conscience and gut. And every once in a while, you know, when we had like uh, fundraisers going around and everything, you know, uh, he come and play. And and um, <laughs> I mean, they, but you know, I'll tell you that one of the things that people don't talk about is there are a lot of people, um, uh, like musicians who played fundraisers. For Kalama Valley to help, you know, wow. to support the eviction. Here's a, I have this right here, as a matter of fact. Yeah, this let's is see. Sunday, July. Huli Kako. And you got people here. Hui Ohana, Sunday Manoa. And this is back in 71, 72, you know. Palani Ivan, I could see Palani Ivan. Palani Ivan, Woke Ale. Wow. You know, and, but these are the ones, they weren't, they weren't entertaining. Uh, in Waikiki. Well, Puyohana was entertaining a cellar in Waikiki. <laughs> but the, the, the movement also redefined what was Hawaiian entertainment because all of a sudden, you know, our focus was on emphasizing and also supporting just the common, well, it seemed common, but you know, the, the music of the people, the music that was coming out at that time. The Gabi Pahinui, the Gabi, the Gabi Pahinui, Pahinui type, that's right. Type. Yeah. And so yeah. Like, the people that you're naming are sort of protégés of you. And, right. And, and musically, you know, and, uh, and, and, and well, and Polani, Polani did it forever. But, you know, I think there's so many interesting people I, and, and, and so little time, but what, what about people like George Cooper? George Cooper, yeah, he came in, um, you know, to learn, a, actually how to help the Kauai Nuku'u'i community. And he, he went back and he, he did help them. Um, and then George, uh, George actually, when he was doing research, I was a journalist and I lived in a condominium uh, in Malaya and George stayed there for about a week uh, with his wife uh, while he was researching land and power in Hawaii. And we had right. discussions as, as well like that. And, that's why if you look at the, the Maui side like that, it's very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there's so many people. And one of the other interesting people I, I thought that um, was, uh, uh, well, you, the Reverend Bob Nakata. Oh, I mean, yeah. he's been around forever. And if you ever want to look for progressive somebody, you know, that will be consistently on the progressive side. You right. gotta, you gotta talk to the reverend. You know what that's right. Like? You know, he was respected by the Japanese community because 
he had these degrees, you know, like in science and things and math. And he was all, you know, and then he was respected by the Hawaiian community because he had sensitivity. He grew up in that area in Kahalu'u. Um, and of course, uh, Bob was very active um, in terms of helping to uh, organize both sides so that there would be a strong coalition. He was, a, he was like the glue, you know, and uh, he helped me out uh, at, when we were um, right now, present day almost, Front Street Apartments in Lahaina, 250 yeah, people. Yeah, let's talk about that because some of these people are still carrying on the good fight, you know? So why don't we talk a little bit about your recent with, with, uh, uh, yeah. events? Well, what happened is that they, the, they couldn't get a bill passed through the legislature to to fund uh, and stop the eviction, fund uh, buying the, the state funding and buying the uh, affordable housing that occupied by the front street tenants and they're about to be evicted. And I gathered together and other people helped me, uh, gathered together a coalition of all the people who actually were were assisted back then uh, in terms of finding housing like Oda Camp, Waiholi Waikani. So we had uh, the president of the Makibaka Association was a child in the arms of Mrs. Manzano in a, in a, it was in a, what do you call it? A big frame of a picture of the residents and she, she was just a child and she attended the meetings uh, to uh, testify and support uh, the French Street tenants. And wow. you, know, you had people from Wai Holy White County doing the same. The Reverend K. Kapali came, you know, and, and testified. And Larry was there and Bob was there. And then, um, yeah. And, and these are people that were way back when it started, you know? And one right. of the interesting things about Kalama Valley was the fact that it really was the beginning of the progressive protest, peace, whatever movements in Hawaii. I, 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 and it, it wasn't just, I think the point that a lot of people don't realize, it, it wasn't just a whole native Hawaiian issues, although there were native Hawaiian uh, attributes to, right. the, uh, to the movement, but it was sort of multi- It was a multi, it was, it was dealing with, uh, yeah, Kalama Valley had a mixture of you know, you had Hawaiians, you had Portuguese, you had Hawaiian Chinese and things like that. And at that point, we didn't ask, what ethnic group are you like that? You know, we just wanted to help. And, and um, it, it worked out really well. And so we used, we applied the same, same formula in terms of, well, you know, I, I called up my contacts and then we started talking uh, with unions like ILW, FLCIO and got them around to supporting the French Street tenants like that because because of my connections with Kuku Hawaii. And eventually it got to be a popular popular thing. Not only did we get the unions, we got the Maui Chamber of Commerce supporting us. <laughs> that's a, <laughs> hey, that's when you know that you, you are really crossing over right to the respectable on side of the dial. <laughs> well, you know, it's so exciting. Uh, you know, unfortunately, we are out of time. But I, I, I want to tell anybody, you know, who's listening uh, to the show uh, and who will be on too. This is a great book. And it's, it's a blueprint. A great story. Yeah. Go ahead. Tell us. Well, it's a blueprint bit. on how to organize and fight an eviction or it could be for a lot of other things, but basically that, that's one of the reasons why I, I assembled it um, because it, there are stories in there on the how-to of it all and it works. I, and, and there's so many interesting people here, which is the, the you know, this is at, at Wallace Fukunaga. The Reverend. The Reverend. Yeah. I, you, you, there were all these reverends involved in, in, in the protest movement. Well, I do. Was Fukuna, Yale graduate. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, guys, thank you so much, Gary. I appreciated you spending this time with me. You're and, you. Um, you know, I hope that uh, we can have more of these people, more opportunities. 
for the people like the individuals you talked about who helped build Hawaii and, and really started, I, I believe that the what we now know as the Hawaiian Renaissance and the Hawaiian movement and the like actually started with uh, these these movements with the Kukua Hawaii. So thank you for being on our show. Appreciate it. And aloha. We'll aloha. see everybody in a couple of weeks. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.